So in your uh, speech today, uh, you said, I consider myself more of a anti-feminist than an MRA. Yes. Why is that? Um, because men's rights activism may not always be needed. Anti-feminism will always be necessary. Um, I actually described it once. I, I forget what the question was that I was considering when I described it. Um, a lot of people describe gender issues as a pendulum, and the pendulum has swung too far. It's not a pendulum. It's an engine. It's an engine that is always pushing in one direction. And the, that direction is the direction of favoring a female. And this is to say, this is the case in every species. Right? So why would it be not the case in ours? Favoring the female, giving the female a significant amount, on average, right, of reproductive power. So in, in most species, you will have, you know, 5% of the males siring all the offspring, and every female sires a few offspring, or produces a few offspring, right? So, and, and this is really the end game of life, is passing on your genes. It's the whole point. The whole reason we behave in any way whatsoever is because we are the product of generations of people who behave that way. Right? And if behaving that way didn't get them laid and didn't get them kids, then we wouldn't be behaving that way. Right? This is the entire game, right? So you 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 have you have this system where it used to be that the harshness of nature, right, and the harshness of people, and scarcity, and war, right, and all of those things kept that engine from getting too far. It, it, there, that was a pushback. That was an, it, men were never the pushback. Men were the ones who were standing between women and the pushback, right? And I guess women interpreted that as because there was a layer of men in between what was pushing against them. They figured men were pushing against them. That was the pushback, and that's all been removed. And now it's free to, to chug along. And, you know, and now you see governments tripping over each other, you know, governments tripping over, politicians tripping over each other to pander to women, to offer women entitlements at the expense of their children, right? That they, they are saddling their children with, you know, $50,000 per capita of debt, right? Before they're even born to pay for free, free birth control pills, right? to pay for affirmative action, to pay for whatever women decide they fancy today, right? Free abortions, whatever, all of this. To pay for having a women's center at every university, right? To pay for all of this, right? We're mortgaging our child's future. We're taking out a second mortgage, maybe a third at this point, on our children's future. They're the ones who are gonna to have to pay, and they're the ones whose ability to pay that we're crippling because we're not raising them in a healthy environment. I mean, this is the thing that really drives me crazy, is this whole last 50 to 75 years has been a huge social experiment perpetrated on all of society, not in the lab, on society. Nobody has any idea how it's going to turn out. Nobody has any idea what the side effects are, right? Uh, the people who are suggesting that we do it have the predictive ability of a coin toss, right? And when their predictions don't come to fruition, what do they tell us? We need more feminism, right? And I mean, we're looking at marriage, right? We, we look at marriage, fem feminism decided early on, and I'm talking around the time of the Declaration of Sentiments, right? That marriage really needed to be destroyed because it was, it was a construct designed to oppress women, right? And the justifications for marriage 
were, you know, having sex outside of marriage is sin. It's against God. If you do it, God won't like you, right? So don't do it, right? That's a justification. And it's an outdated one. It's an outmoded one. It's, it's, it's not really a reasonable justification to any enlightened individual, right? So we figured because the justification was fallacious, right, that we could just toss out marriage, right? And we could toss out the idea of, you know, having sex outside of marriage is a bad thing. Right? But that's because we never understood what the function of marriage was, what the purpose of marriage was. And it wasn't a purpose that with, you know, somebody dreamed it up and then imposed it on everyone. It was just something that people did and it worked, right? And it worked because it performed a function. And nobody really knew what that was, but they just knew it worked. It made for a stable society and, and all of that. Here's what the function of marriage was. Every single child has a father that can be identified as the father of that child and can be held responsible for that child's well-being financially okay? and to protect that child and the mother. Right? That was the whole purpose of marriage, was attaching fathers to children because that's the weakest. It's the weakest, you know, you have that, you have that, Men love women, women love babies, babies love puppies, right? It's that hierarchy and the weakest bond in the family, right? And the most valuable one is the father-child bond, right? The, the father-child bond took us from chimpanzees to where we are today. That's, that's, that's one of the major factors that did it. And that's the one that marriage strengthened. The mother-child bond will exist whether there is marriage or not, whether there is, uh, whether a man knows this child is mine or not, right? The father-child bond is the one that is most easily broken, most easily severed. That is the one that needs to be bolstered, and that is what marriage did. It not only held men accountable for the children they created, but it made them feel proud to do so, to be accountable for them. It made them feel respected for being responsible for these children. It made them feel appreciated, right? It rewarded them, not even with tangible things, but with intangible things like respect and honor and admiration and, you know, all of those things that used to be attached and that, that are highly valued by men. And we've, we've thrown all of that in the trash. We have. And, and now we've replaced it with child support. Money. This is where I get confused in the men's rights movement, though, because I, I hear some MRAs saying we need to strengthen the family, like Aaron Kuzzi, it sounds like you stand like that, and Aaron, uh, Ann Cole. But then I hear other MRAs say that why even get married if, if it's not a safe place for men and there, you have men who go their own way? And well, yeah. I don't see those as contradictory. I don't. One sounds Until, like the traditional family and the other sounds like get away with it. Well, no. Do it. it, it well, there is no traditional family now. There is no traditional family now. Um, you know, you get married, you're not going to be respected. Only if your wife decides that she is going to respect you. Right? Are you going to be respected? She doesn't have to. There's no, there's no law. There's no social pressure on her to do so. In fact, she will be applauded for disrespecting you, right? Socially, um, and for bad mouthing you and and treating you like like dirt. She will, she will be you go girl, you know, by lots of people, right? So I mean, there is no traditional marriage. There is no father and husband who is respected and admired for his wisdom and his diligence and his responsibility and his willingness to go out and work a 70 hour week for the good of his family, right? If he does go out and work a 70 hour week for the good of his family, his wife will complain that he's never home, right? And she's not doing, he's not doing enough for her, right? Often, right? And, or even if she's not so inclined, she could be. And, and there's no, there's no recourse for that. Because he knows that the moment the marriage ends, he's lost his kids. They're gone. Are you saying that's the majority, though? Because there are a lot of marriages where the man does not respect the wife, and she's doing all you know, child of rearing course. and the housework. So where does the majority minority lie? The majority of 
Um, it's not a matter of the majority or the minority, because those are problems regardless of how often they happen. Yeah. Right? In either direction. They're problems regardless of how often they happen or who it happens more to, which, which, sex, which sex it happens more to. What, what the issue is, is the system reinforces women doing those things, right? And the system will punish men who do those things. That is the problem, right? And I, I saw that so clearly. When I split from my husband, and I, I don't talk about my ex-husband very much, uh, I don't do it because there's really no realistic way he can defend himself or tell his side of the story. And I actually really do still care about him. I care about him and I, I, I want him to be doing well and being okay and all like that, right? It was just impossible to live with him and I think he was no happier than I was, so... But, um... When, when it comes to the divorce process, and I mean, he was, he was recalcitrant, he was, he was combative. And the reason he was combative was because he'd been through it before, and he wasn't combative before. He had tried to be cooperative before, and he got taken to the cleaners. And so this time, he was not going to let that happen, so he kind of came out swinging. And uh, even so, I probably could have completely destroyed him. And it would, I would not have had to pay my lawyer even $500 more than I ended up paying my lawyer in order to completely destroy my ex. I showed my lawyer the separation agreement my ex and I drew up for the first, to cover the first year. It would expire at the end of a year. And my lawyer said, I should smack you signing this. And I said, I thought it was fair. It's fair. He said, you were entitled to so much more. And then when it was time to negotiate the divorce, I, I actually wanted to be very fair. But because there were already lawyers involved, therefore it had to actually be really analyzed by a judge. And um, because the judge had to sign off on it, or I would not be granted a divorce. I could not be anywhere near as fair as I wanted to be and have a judge still willing, willing to sign it. These are things that I didn't even ask for, right? I didn't even ask for them, I didn't want them. And the judge imposed that, right, in the agreement, or he would not sign it, right? So imagine what would happen if I had decided I was going to completely fuck over my husband, right? I was going to completely ruin his life. He would be, he would still be living in a car after five, six years of us being apart. How did it get to this point? How did it get to the point of lawyers having their their direction swayed. Well, it's because women uh, are seen in a specific way, and one of the ways they're seen is they're harmless, they're innocent, and they're victims, and they are not strong enough to defend themselves, and they need somebody to help them. And lawyers are as shivers as anyone else, and so are judges. And, uh, and men are seen as capable and self sufficient, and all of those things that help you get a job, but really don't help you when you need help. Right? And I forget whether it was Tom Golden or Warren Farrell today who said one of the problems is, or was it yesterday maybe, one of the problems is that uh, when men need help, when men say they need help, they have just forfeited their right to it. The act of saying, as a man, the act of saying, I need help, forfeits a man his right to help. Right? Because any man who needs to be helped, does, he's not a man and he doesn't deserve our help. And I've, I've seen this all over the place. 
right? I mean, there are people who will help you get a job, there are people who will help you hook you up with whatever, right? As long as you don't appear to need it, right? The moment you actually need it, you actually reach out and say, I really need your help, yeah, you're done. Every you're you're like people erase your phone your phone number off their their cell phones. They they stop taking your calls because nobody sees a man like that as someone who is worth even knowing. Right? What can you do for anybody? Needs help. So I mean, it's a huge, huge thing. It's a huge paradox, and I see it playing out all the time. Even look at how feminists deal with this. Feminists say, well, well, feminism is about men too, right? And then, so MRAs often, very often, not MRAs yet, they're still calling themselves feminists. They say, well, what about men and this and this and this? Oh, well, that's not our job, okay? You go and solve those problems yourself. Right? You stop derailing our conversation. This, this space is about women, right? So then these men go off by themselves and start trying to deal with it. And then feminism says, you can't do that. You have to examine this within feminism, right? There are plenty of places within feminism to deal with men's problems, right? So then the men come and they say, well, well what about the men? Oh, what about the men's, you know, uh, just, Go sit down in the corner and be quiet. Stop de stop mansplaining to us, right? Oh, you neckbeard, you neckbeard. Oh, shed some beard tears. I drink those for breakfast, right? I mean, they, they say things like this, right? They say things like this to men who've been victims of rape and domestic violence who talk about their issues, right, and try and talk about it. They say those things to these people who have been victims, right? Without any sense of compassion or anything. Oh, shed some more beard tears. Yeah, adjust your fedora, loser, right? I, I saw one say, brag about, oh, I have a new purse. I made it out of baby foreskins that I stitched together, right? Like, just absolute disgusting cruelty, right? These are the people who told them, you can't discuss your issues without us, right? Sort of guiding you. Right? And then they come and try and do that, and then, they, then this is what they say to them. So then they go off and try to talk about them on their own. And then feminism says, you bunch of misogynist rape apologists, how dare you look at these issues outside the lens of feminism, right? And, and the whole thing just repeats, right? And so, like, a whole, a huge amount of MRAs, male MRAs, are, are former feminists. Many of them were, were, were raised by feminists to be feminist. Right. And they tried to deal with men's issues within the feminist movement. They tried to have them addressed in some way. And they were, and I don't think most of these men, because some of them are still uh, thinking that we should, we should eventually come to some kind of cooper cooperation or, or compromise or, or negotiation, right? Um, I don't think any of these men were you know, hostile originally, right, when they were presenting their issues. And I don't think they would have given up on feminism that easily, right? It wouldn't have just been like one afternoon, some feminists said something shitty to them. No. Uh, it was a long, hard road away from that and, and to dropping the name and dropping a sense of belonging, right, for a lot of these guys. And then they came to us, and, and the reason they're MRAs is because they were feminists. If they had never been feminists, they would not be MRAs. And if they had never been feminists, they would not be anti-feminists.